punch with a sharp contrasty image and vibrant colours. It's also fully Android enabled so can operate on its own without it being plugged into anything, making it brilliant for watching online content with friends and family. For this explainer I'm going to project a slide image, which is basically a small transparent photograph. When it's placed in front of a light source all it does is cast vague blurry colours, so it needs to be brought into focus by a lens. Here though you might be surprised to see that the result is a single bright spot in the middle. This is because the lens is only seeing a single bright point of light, so the rest of the image remains dark as a result. To understand exactly what's going on here we need to plot out the rays of light. So our basic projector setup so far consists of a projection lens, an image and a light source. All the light rays are radiating out from this light source with no directionality, so the rays that actually hit the back of the projection lens are the ones that have only passed through the middle of the image. To rectify this and keep the light source close by, projectors use an additional lens between the light source and the image set up to collimate the light rays to make them parallel, and this results in the full image now being projected. Efficiency can be increased further with the addition of a converging lens, which directs the parallel rays straight towards the back of the projection lens, making the Taking a look at the inside you can see that it's essentially made of different layers, all supported by four threaded rods to allow for accurate positioning during construction. To make the layers themselves I suggest using aluminium, as it's cheap, strong and easy to work with. Each layer has to be a 20cm square, with a hole in each corner for the threaded rods to fit through. Now these also need various holes and cutouts made in them throughout the build depending on what components they support, but I'll cover this as we go along. So to start the frame off we're going to make the base layer, and as this will be externally visible I'm going to add some matte black vinyl wrap to it, as it's quicker than painting and gives a good overall finish. We can now take one of the rods and thread a pillar spacer onto it, followed by the new black layer, clamping it in place with a capped dome nut. The spacing provided by the pillars needs to add about 4cm, so you may need to add a few of them to achieve this. Anyway once all four threaded rods have been clamped in place you can see that the dome nuts function as feet. To address the rods wobbling around though we can add the first additional layer, which can again be clamped in place with some nuts. The space between these layers will be used to house various power wires, so it needs a hole made in it for these wires to pass through later. So with the internal frame now started it's ready to be built upon, and the first component we're going to add is the light source. For this we'll need a 100 watt LED, a heat sink and a power board, links to all of which you can find in this video's description. As we want the projector to have vivid and vibrant colours, I recommend choosing an LED with a high colour rendering index, or CRI. This does mean that you'll be spending a bit more on it, but it's money well spent as it directly affects the final image in a significant way. One thing to consider when you choose yours is its diameter however, as this will affect your lens choice. I'll be going into this in detail later, but for now just take it that the larger the LED's surface area, the wider the aperture opening on the lens has to be. Either way, as the LEDs are so bright, they do get very hot, which is what the heatsink is for. Using a CPU cooler from a computer is ideal for this, and old ones can be found online quite cheaply. Its size might lead some to think that it's overkill for this use case, but it's actually ideal as it will mean that the final projector will operate more quietly due to the additional cooling headroom provided by the large cooler, allowing for slower spinning fans. So to mount this heatsink we can place it on top of the base and thread four nuts onto the rods so that they match the heatsink's height. These are for supporting a new layer, with more nuts being used to tightly clamp it in place. As you can see, on this new layer I've already added a hole for the LED to see out through, and a vent slot along one edge. This slot is the start of the airflow cooling path that will allow air to pass through the entire projector keeping it cool. It is an essential step, and every layer needs one of these vents. Anyway, once the LED has some wires soldered to it, it should be able to fit nicely into its hole. The heatsink can then have a small dot of thermal compound added to its centre and then be clamped against the LED, resulting in both components being held securely in place. The LED can now be hooked up to its power board, which is in fact a voltage booster. 
Before this gets hooked up though, you need to adjust it to the correct values for your specific LED. And you can find an entire video on how to do this on the DIY Perks Extra channel, a link to which you can find in this video's description. A good place to mount this power board by the way is underneath the heatsink's base, as it can make contact with the heatsink here and take advantage of its cooling ability. So with that done and working, it's time to take control over these light rays and quite literally bend them to our will. Our goal here is, if you remember, to take the radiating light rays and first make them parallel, and then direct them to where the projection lens will be later. Instead of using large expensive glass lenses for these, we're going to use what are known as Fresnel lenses, which are basically flat lenses that slice up the required curvature to achieve a much thinner and cheaper lens, and they're usually made out of plastic. They can be bought as a set specifically for DIY projector projects like this, and I've put a link to some in this video's description. Each one needs to be fitted onto its own layer, and again, don't forget the vent slots. Now I've made one of mine black to differentiate it during this video, so the silver one is going to act as the collimator lens, which makes the rays parallel, while the black one is going to act as the converging lens. So the silver collimator lens needs to be mounted in place first, with its Fresnel ridges facing upwards. To achieve collimation, it does need to be precisely positioned above the LED at its specified focal length, which for mine is 90mm. If you don't know the exact focal length of yours, or you want to make sure that it is absolutely precise and accurate, a good way of taking this measurement can be done before the LED got mounted in place by doing a reverse pre place a scrap piece of aluminium where the LED goes to provide a surface to focus on, and then tilt the whole thing towards the sun, our most distant light source. Now this is going to get very bright, so never look directly at the focused point. Instead, use a pin to poke a tiny hole through a piece of electrical tape, and then stick this over your smartphone's camera to block most of the light so that you don't damage its sensor. You can then preview what you're doing on the screen without ever looking directly at the light yourself. The goal here is to adjust the positioning of the lens so that it projects the sun into a single tiny dot. When you're satisfied, take the measurement of this new position and note it down, as this is the lens's true focal length. Now, just to prove that this is a very intense point of light, this dry stick spontaneously combusts when it touches the focal point. Yikes. Anyway, once it's all in place, you can tell that it is in fact working as a collimator, because the LED, which is at its focal point, doesn't appear to change in size when you move closer to it. Pretty wild. It's essentially been pinned at infinity, and it's like we're looking out at it through a window. When the LED is lit up, it affects shadows in a similar way. They don't change in size like you would expect from a local light source, it just goes between blurry and sharp. Anyway, after adding some pillar spaces, the next lens can be slid down, but this time with its smooth side facing upwards. In this configuration, it takes the parallel light rays and condenses them down to a single point where the projection lens will be later. For now though, it's time to work on the focusing system. The way we're going to adjust focus is by moving the image layer forwards and backwards, and this changes the distance between it and the projection lens, allowing us to keep the projected image crisp and sharp. This movement is going to be achieved by taking advantage of the threaded rods, allowing for very fine adjustment of focus. To start this off, we'll need a layer with a large cutout in the middle for light to pass through unobstructed, along with, you guessed it, a vent slot. We need to screw a few small pillar supports onto this layer first though, as it's part one of two, and it also needs to have a piece of clear acrylic added over the cutout so that air is prevented from passing through it, and instead has to go through the provided vent slot. So to get each corner of this platform to rise and fall in unison, we're going to utilise a set of four GT2 timing belt pulleys. But as you can see, they don't bite the rods, so we need to add some threads to them. An easy way of doing this is to get some threaded inserts and ins- oh, <laughs> well, uh, they're slightly too large, so a quick spin in a drill with a file trims them down to size, and then they can be clamped in place with the grub screws. Nice. These can now be screwed down in place, and to make them all synchronised we can use a GT2 timing belt, 
The two idler pulleys you see here help to keep it nice and tight over a fifth pulley which has a knob attached. This keeps them all successfully synchronised, so once the second part is added it will rise and fall evenly and reliably. This second part is actually the most exciting part of the build, as it is in fact the vitally important image source. Now in my demonstration earlier I used this little slide image and as it's transparent light can just shine through it to be projected by the lens. But obviously we want to watch video so we need some kind of screen that light can shine through. And you know what works for that? A small LCD panel with its backlight removed. Small LCDs like this are used in smartphones and you can buy them off eBay along with a control board that adds an HDMI input making it a high pixel density mini monitor. You can of course find links to these in the description and they're really not that expensive, even for a 2560 by 1440 pixel panel. That will provide a superbly sharp projected image and will be certainly good enough for most use cases so is my recommendation. Monumental difference. So it's going to be interesting to see whether we can retain this detail in the final projected image. So stay tuned for some in-depth tests later. My particular phone has a smashed back, so it was actually a very cheap eBay buy. It is worth noting though that this remarkable 4K panel does now appear to be available separately on eBay with an HDMI control board, though it is rather expensive. I've put a link to it in the description if any of you are interested however. Anyway, if you choose to use a phone too, even if it's just to keep costs low by using an old one that you have lying around, you need to make sure that one, it actually uses an LCD panel rather than something like an OLED which wouldn't work for this job, and two, it has to have USB OTG support so that you can plug in a mouse and keyboard to operate it remotely once it's all boxed in. With those checkboxes checked, the first thing to do is dismantle the phone far enough to reach the display. Online phone fixing guides are great for this, and it's not terribly difficult. So with the body and screen now separated, we can mount the body to one of the layers using some right angle brackets. As you can see, I've replaced the battery with a small voltage step down board set to 4.2 volts and added an accompanying 1 farad capacitor, which helps with any power demand spikes. I decided to do this because my particular phone doesn't allow for the battery to be charged when USB OTG is in use, so emulating an infinite battery is the only option I have. If you went with an HDMI control board display instead of recycling a smartphone, it would likely have to be mounted here in a similar way. For both screen types though, we need to remove the backlight system entirely, which usually involves just lifting the various layers out and delicately disconnecting the backlight strip to stop it from illuminating. Don't be tempted to peel off the reflective layer that's stuck to the back of the screen though, as this is the polarising layer, and the screen just wouldn't display anything if it wasn't there. With the various layers removed, you can now see that it's basically transparent, meaning that it's ready to be mounted onto its layer. I recommend using tape to hold it temporarily in place for this, and then following up with some epoxy to make it permanent. It can then be slid down on top of the focusing platform and screwed to its pillar supports. This now makes the GT2 pulleys captive, so that adjusting the knob results in a very even and precise rise and fall. It's worth noting that this system is entirely internal, which makes the build simpler overall. Notice too how the front of this layer is black, which is important as this particular layer is brought into focus by the lens. Anyway, with that we're nearly finished, meaning that the last thing to tackle is the all-important projection lens. There are a few things to consider when choosing your lens, the most important being the lens's image circle. You see, while you can purchase an old full frame SLR camera lens for next to nothing, SLR lenses are designed to cover a 36 by 24 mm frame, the same size in fact of that tiny slide I used earlier. If we were to use one of these lenses in our projector, we would only see the very centre of the screen projected because our display is so much larger than what a full frame lens is designed to cover. So what we need is an old lens type known as large format. These were used in old box cameras and wet plate cameras, and were designed with an image circle that was way larger than those of full frame lenses. This means that so long as you use a large format camera lens, it's likely to cover the entire phone screen with ease, 
Even ancient ones have great optical quality and are very cheap on eBay. You can, as usual, find the search terms link in the description if you need help finding them. One other aspect to consider, however, is its aperture. The aperture defines how much light a lens lets through, so you'd think that having a wider aperture would result in a brighter image no matter what, right? Well, not for us, because we've got the converging lens that basically makes the aperture irrelevant so long as the aperture opening is physically wider than the LED we're using, like I mentioned earlier. So for my LED, which is tiny at only 16mm in diameter, a lens with an f9 aperture is fine, and there's no loss of light. If I were to use an LED with a larger diameter, it would necessitate the need for something like an f4 lens, which means that it has a much bigger aperture. Focal length is important too, as your lens needs to have a shorter focal length than that of the converging lens we added earlier. This is so that it can focus on the screen while still being in the optimal position for the converging lens. Once you've got your lens, it can be mounted onto its very own layer, and slid in place. Again, the positioning of it is vital to get it to work properly. I tested mine before mounting the image layer in place by having the LED lit and moving the lens up and down until there was no vignetting or colour fringing. Just a perfect white square. I then took note of this measurement, allowing me to now confidently slide it right down in place at this current stage. Now, one thing that you might be noticing is that everything is pointing upwards towards the ceiling. This is just part of the projector's design, because it keeps the projector's footprint very small. And to direct the light forwards, we're going to simply use a mirror. Ideally, this needs to be a front surface mirror, meaning that the reflective surface is on the top rather than behind a piece of glass. This increases image quality dramatically as it eliminates ghosting. To keep costs low, you might want to make one yourself from a standard mirror, and it's actually quite easy to do. You can find a link to a video about how to do it in the description. Either way, this mirror needs to be mounted onto its own layer and fixed to the projector at a 45 degree angle. This mirror also corrects for the flipped image effect that's caused when light passes through a lens, which is why when mounting the screen you can just put it the right way up. So now we've just got a few finishing touches to make before we can try it out. These finishing touches start with routing any power wires down to the base. For mine, I extended a USB OTG cable so that I could route the phone's USB port down to a USB hub, which will allow me to plug in various devices for the phone to utilise, like say a keyboard or a USB drive. Also, at this point you will need to add the fans, which in my case are both configured to push air outwards from the central gap, and they too are powered through a voltage regulator so that they can be set to spin at a slower speed by undervolting them. It is very important that these fans do indeed push air outwards like this, and I'll explain why in just a minute. As you can see, I've also added a power socket on the bottom. Lastly, a piece of plastic needs to be glued in front of the phone so that it blocks any light that might otherwise reflect off it. And with that, the core of the projector is complete. To box it in, we just need to make some aluminium side panels and add some vinyl wrap to make both sides black. You'll notice that there are some large square cutouts in them, and their function is to allow air in and out. You see, because the fans push air outwards, it means that internally the projector has a slight negative pressure compared to the atmosphere around it. This means that the air will gently pull into these top cutouts, zigzagging all the way down, keeping each component cool. This is particularly important for the screen, as it would otherwise get damaged from overheating due to the amount of bright light that hits it from behind. To stop dust from entering, however, we need to glue some speaker fabric in place. This allows air to pass through easily enough, but does catch all the dust. It is slightly transparent, however, so to block any stray light from the screen from being visible through it, I suggest cutting out some cardboard and covering them with vinyl wrap, after which they can be glued over the top of these vents, but with a spacing gap large enough for air to still go around them. The reason for going with cardboard here, by the way, is merely to allow the phone's Wi-Fi signal to pass through, which would otherwise be blocked if we used something like aluminium. To mount these onto the projector, I suggest making a few clips. I've 3D printed mine, but you could quite easily make these out of wood. Another thing I recommend is placing a piece of acrylic over the mirror and lens section to stop it from getting dusty too, 
and I've made the front grille magnetised so that I can take it off and operate the phone directly if ever needed. Once the excess threaded rod is trimmed off and capped off with some dome nuts, the projector is complete.